Hare Krishna devotees, welcome to day 33 of our Bhaktivedanta seminar on Srimad Bhagavatam Canto 4. And we are in chapter 14, which is titled The Story of King Vena. And we're just beginning, uh, beginning the chapter. First of all, let us chant our prayers. Nama Om Vishnupadaya Krishna Prestaya Bhutale Shimadi Bhakti Vedanta Swamaniti Namane Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Pastya Chadesha Tarane Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhunicha Ananda Sri Advaita Gadadha Shivasadi Gaurav Bhakti Vrinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Vanchakapa Trulubius Chai Kripa Sindhu Pya Eva Cha. Padidanam Pavane Bio Vaishnava Bio Namo Namaha. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. <coughs> yes, so devotees, here we go. Uh, Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 4, Chapter 14. The story of King Vena and there are let's see six sections 46 verses so the first section is from verse 1 to verse 6 the rule of King Vena second section verse 7 to verse 12 the sages consider what to do about Vena Third section, verse 13 to verse 22, the sages approach King Vena. Fourth section, verse 23 to verse 28, Vena responds to the sages. The fifth section, verse 29 to verse 34, the sages kill King Vena. Oh, Krishna. Sixth section, the, uh, from verse 35 to verse 46, the Nishada is born from the churning of Vena's thighs. This, all right, so there we go, devotees. Let us get into it. So the rule of King Vena, it's verse 1 to verse 6. And I think we need to read the verses first of all. Verse 1, the great sage Maitreya continued, O great hero Vidura, the great sages headed by Brigu were always thinking of the welfare of the people in general. When they saw that in the absence of King Anga, there was no one to protect the interests of the people, they understood that without a ruler, the people would become independent and non-regulated. Verse 2. The sages then called for the queen mother, Sunita, and with her permission they installed Vena on the throne as master of the world. All the ministers, however, disagreed with this. Verse 3, it was already known that Vena was very severe and cruel. Therefore, as soon as all the thieves and, and rogues in the state heard of his ascendance to the royal throne, they became very much afraid of him. Indeed, they hid themselves here and there as rats hide themselves from snakes. Verse 4, when the king ascended to the throne, he became all-powerful with eight kinds of opulences. Consequently, he became too proud. By virtue of his false prestige, he considered himself to be greater than anyone. Thus he began to insult great personalities. Verse 5. When he became overly blind 
due to his opulences, King Vena mounted a chariot and, like an uncontrolled elephant, began to travel through the kingdom, causing the sky and earth to tremble wherever he went. Verse 6. All the twice-born, the Brahmins, were forbidden henceforward to perform any sacrifice, and they were also forbidden to give charity or offer clarified butter, ghee. Thus King Vena sounded kettle drums throughout the countryside. In other words, he stopped all kinds of religious rituals. Right, so devotees, let's uh, go back. Verse 1, and we'll, we'll read through the purports also. Make a few comments as we always do. Verse 1. The great sage Maitreya continued, O great, o great hero Vidura, the sages headed by Brigu, were always thinking of the welfare of the people in general. When they saw that in the absence of King Anga, there was no one to protect the interests of the people, they understood that without a ruler, the people would become independent and non-regulated. So in this verse, the word Kshema Darshana is significant. It, it refers to those who always look after the, the welfare of the people in general. So all the great sages, headed by Brigu, were doing that. They were trying to bring them to Krishna consciousness, trying to bring all the people in general. Um, and they advised the kings of the universe to look after their subjects like that. And the kings would then do that because the Brahmins had such authority. But after the disappearance of King Anga, there was no one to follow the sages' instructions. So the citizens became unruly. They're compared to animals. Bhagavad Gita chapter 7 verse 13 explains, society must be divided into four orders by quality and work. In every society, there has to be an intelligent class, administrative class, productive class and worker class. But in modern democracy, these things are, Prabhupada says, topsy-turvy. By vote, sudras are chosen for administrative posts. It's, it's kind of humorous. And no wonder, no wonder society is just such a disastrous mess. Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, having no knowledge of the ultimate goal of life, such persons such persons whimsically enact laws without knowledge of life's purpose. The result is that no one is happy. Excuse me, verse 2. The great sages then called for the Queen Mother Sunita, and with her permission they installed Vena on the throne as master of the world. All the ministers, however, disagreed with this, with, with this. Verse 3. It was already known that Vena was very severe and cruel. Therefore, as soon as all the thieves and rogues in the state heard of his ascendance to the royal throne, they became very much afraid of him. Indeed, they hid themselves here and there, as rats hide themselves from snakes. Yeah. So there's, there's a, a purport here, very short, let me read it, what, it's three sentences. When the government is very weak, rogues and thieves flourish. Similarly, when the government is very strong, all the thieves and rogues disappear or hide themselves. Of course, Vena was not a very good king, but he was known to be cruel and severe. 
Thus, thus the state at least became freed from thieves and rogues. Verse 4, when the king ascended to the throne, he became all-powerful with eight kinds of opulences. Consequently, he became too proud. By virtue of his false prestige, he considered himself to be greater than anyone. Thus he began to insult great personalities. Uh, yes, the purport, Prabhupada says the word Ashta Vibhutabi is very important. Ashta Vibhutabi means by eight opulences. What are those eight opulences? Well, we don't know exactly. Um, but a couple of them are mentioned here. Yeah, a couple of them, a couple of them. Not so many. Right, so uh, by dint of mystic yoga, the kings generally acquired these eight opulences. So they were called Rajaushis, kings, who were also great sages. So by practicing mystic yoga, a Rajaushi could become smaller than the smallest, greater than the greatest, and could get whatever he desired. A Rajaushi could also create a kingdom bring everyone under his control and rule everyone. These were some of the opulences of a king. There you go, some of the opulences. King Vena, however, was not practiced in yoga, <clears throat> but he became very proud of his royal position nonetheless. Because he was not very considerate, he began to misuse his power and insult great personalities. Verse 5, when he became overly proud, when he became overly blind due to his opulences, King Vena mounted a chariot and like an uncontrolled elephant, he began to travel through the kingdom, causing the sky and earth to tremble wherever he went. So verse 6, all the twice-born the Brahmins were forbidden henceforward to perform any sacrifice and they're also forbidden to give charity or offer clarified butter. Thus King Vena sounded kettle drums throughout the countryside. In other words, he stopped all kinds of religious rituals. All right, so this short purport here. What Vena did long ago is now being done by the atheistic governments all over the world. The world situation is so tense that any time governments may issue declarations to stop religious rituals, eventually the situation will become so degraded it will be impossible for pious men to live on the planet. So saying people should become Krishna conscious very seriously so they can go back to Godhead without having to suffer all these miserable conditions. Okay, so let's have a look here. Uh, section 2, verse 7 to verse 12. The sages consider what to do about Vena. So let's read the verses, just the verses. Therefore all the great sages assembled together and after observing cruel Vena's atrocities concluded that a great danger and catastrophe was approaching the, king, the, the people of the world. Thus out of compassion they began to talk amongst themselves for they themselves were the performers of sacrifice. Verse 8, when the sages consulted one another, they saw that the people were in a dangerous position from both directions. When a fire blazes on both ends of a log, the ants in the middle are in a very dangerous situation. Similarly, at that time, the people in general we're in a dangerous position due to an irresponsible king. 
on one side and thieves and rogues on the other. Verse 9, thinking to save the state from irregularity, the sages began to consider that it was due to a political crisis that they made Vain a king, although he was not qualified. But alas, now the people were, were being disturbed by the ringer himself. Under such circumstances, how could the people be happy? Verse 10, the sages began to think within themselves. Because he was born from the womb of Sunita, King Vayner is by nature very mischievous. Supporting this mischievous king is exactly like maintaining a snake with milk. Now he has become a source of all difficulties. Verse 11, we appointed this vain a king of the state in order to give protection to the citizens, but now he has become the enemy of the citizens. Despite all these discrepancies, we should at once try to pacify him. By doing so, we may not be touched by the sinful results caused by him. 12. The saintly sages continued thinking. Of course, we're completely aware of his mischievous nature, yet nevertheless we enthroned Vena. If we cannot persuade King Vena to accept our advice, he will be con condemned by the public and we will join them. Thus, by our, pr our prowess, we shall burn him to ashes. So, right, let's go through the verses with their purports. Verse 7. Therefore all the great sages assembled together, and after observing cruel Vayner's atrocities, concluded that a great danger and catastrophe was approaching the people of the world. Thus out of compassion they began to talk among themselves, for they themselves were the performers of the sacrifices. Right, let's have a look at the purport. Before Vena was enthroned, the sages were anxious to see to the welfare of society. When they saw how bad he was, they began to think again of this. It should be understood that sages, saintly people, devotees, are not, concern, are not unconcerned with people's welfare. The Kamis, of course, are busy getting money for sense gratification. Gyanis are socially aloof, speculating for liberation. So actual devotees and saints are always anxious to see how the people can be happy materially and spiritually. So now they began to consult with one another how to get out of the dangerous atmosphere created by King Vena. Verse 8. When the great sages consulted one another, they saw that the people were in a dangerous position from both sides, from both directions. When a fire blazes on both ends of a log, of a log the ants in the middle are in a very dangerous situation. Similarly, at that time, the people in general were in a dangerous position due to an irresponsible king on one side and thieves and rogues on the other. There are no, there's no purport to this verse. Verse 9. Thinking to save the state from irregularity, the sages began to consider that it was due to a political crisis that they made King Vena that they made Vayner a king, although he was not qualified. But alas, now the people were being disturbed by the king himself. Under such circumstances, how could the people be happy? Right, let's have a look at the purport. It's not very big, but it's there. So, Bhagavad Gita, at the end, more or less, says the renounced order should not give up sacrifice, charity, and penance. The Brahmins must perform sacrifices 
grihastas must give in charity, and those in the renounced order of life, the, the vanaprastas and sannyasis, must practice penance and austerities. By doing these things, everyone can be elevated to the spiritual platform. So when the sages and others saw that Vena had stopped these things, they became concerned for people's progress. Certainly people preach Krishna consciousness because they're anxious to save people from the dangers of animalistic life. It must be a good government to see people doing their, uh, there must be a good government to see that people are doing their religious duties and thieves and rogues must be curbed. Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, when this is done, the people can advance peacefully in spiritual consciousness and make their lives successful. Verse 10, the sages began to think within themselves. Because he was born from the womb of Sunita, King Vayner is, very, is by nature very mischievous. Supporting this mischievous king is exactly like maintaining a snake with milk. Now he has become a source of all difficulties. So saintly people, Prabhupada says, and there's a purport here, Prabhupada says saintly people are generally aloof from social activities and materialistic life. Um, Vena was supported by the saintly people just to protect the citizens from rogues and thieves. But when he was on the throne, he became a source of trouble to the sages. Saintly people, of course, are especially interested in sacrifices, austerities for advancement of spiritual life. But Vena, instead of being obliged to them, became their enemy. And he, he prohibited them from doing their Varnashram duties, particularly the Brahmins. Srila Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, A serpent who is maintained with milk and bananas simply stores poison in his teeth and awaits for the day to, to bite his master. Verse 11, We appointed this vain a king of the state in order to give protection to the citizens. But now he's become the enemy of the citizens. Despite all these discrepancies, we should at once try to pacify him. By doing so, we may not be touched by the sinful re results caused by him. Right, let's have a look at the purport. So, the sages are afraid of getting sinful reactions through their connections with Vena. The laws of karma prohibit a person from associating with mischievous, with a mischievous individual. By electing Vena to, to the throne, the sages certainly associated with him. Ultimately, he was so bad, the sages were afraid of becoming contaminated by his by his activities. But still, before taking any action against him, they wanted to try to pacify and correct him. Last chance if it's possible. Twelve, the saintly sage, sages continued thinking. Of course, we're completely aware of his mischievous nature. Yet nevertheless, we enthroned Vena. If we cannot persuade King Vena to accept our advice, he will be con condemned by the public and we will join them. Thus, by our, pr our prowess, we shall burn him to ashes. So saintly people, of course, they're not interested in politics. They're always thinking of the welfare of the people. So, but sometimes they have to come down to the political field to take steps to correct 
a misguided, a misguided government or royalty. But in Kali Yuga, the saintly people are not powerful as they were before. Previously, they could burn the sinful to ashes by their spiritual prowess. Now they can't due to Kali Yuga's influence. Now they can't do sacrifices also in which the animals get new life. So now they shouldn't take part in politics, but rather engage in chanting Hare Krishna. So Prabhupada concludes the purple by saying, by the grace of Lord Chaitanya, by simply chanting this Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, the general populace can derive all benefits without political implications. Okay, now section three. The sages approach King Vena. It's verse 13 to verse 22. Right, so, verse 13, we'll read through the verses. The great sages, having thus decided, approached King Vena. Concealing their real anger, they pacified him with sweet words, and then spoke as follows. 14. The great sages said, Dear King, we have come to give you good advice. Kindly hear us with great attention. By doing so, your duration of life and your opulent strength and reputation will increase. Okay, verse 15. Those who live according to religious principles and who follow them by words, mind, body and intelligence are elevated to the heavenly kingdom, which is devoid of all miseries. Being thus rid of the material influence, they achieve unlimited happiness in life. Verse 16. The sages continued. O oh, great hero, for this reason you should not be the cause of spoiling the spiritual life of the general populace. If their spiritual life is spoiled because of, because of your activities, you will sort of certainly fall down from your opulent and royal position. Verse 17, the saintly persons continued. When the king protects the citizens, from the disturbances of mischievous ministers, as well as from thieves and rogues. He can, by virtue of such pious activities, accept taxes given by his subjects. Thus a pious king can certainly enjoy himself in this world, as well as in the life after death. Verse 18, <clears throat> the king is supposed to be pious, in whose state and cities the general populace strictly observes the system of eight social orders of Vana and Ashram, and where all citizens, all citizens engage in worshipping the Supreme Personality of Godhead by their particular occupations. Verse 19, O noble one, if the king sees that the Supreme Personality of Godhead the original cause of the cosmic manifestation uh, and the super soul within everyone is worshipped, the, the, the Lord will be satisfied. Verse 20, the Supreme Personality of Godhead is worshipped by the great demigods, controllers of universal affairs. When he's satisfied, nothing is impossible to achieve. For this reason, all the demigods the presiding deities of the different planets, as well as the inhabitants of their planets, take great pleasure in offering all kinds of paraphernalia for his worship. Verse 21. Dear King, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, along with the predominating deities, is the enjoyer of the results of all sacrifices in all planets. The Supreme Lord is the sum total of the three Vedas, the owner of everything and the ultimate goal of all austerity. Therefore, your countrymen should engage in, to, in performing various sacrifices for your elevation. Indeed, 
you should always direct them towards the offering of sacrifices. Verse 22. When all the Brahmins engage in performing sacrifices in your kingdom, all the demigods who are plenary expansions of the Lord will be very much satisfied by their activities and will give you your, your desired result. Therefore, O hero, do not stop the sacrificial performances. If you stop them, you will disrespect the demigods. Okay, so back we go. 13 to 22, the sages approach King Vena. 13, the great sages, having thus decided, approached King Vena. Concealing their real anger, they pacified him with sweet words and then spoke as follows. The great sages say, said, Dear King, we have come to give you good advice. Kindly hear us with great attention. By doing so, your duration of life and your opulence, strength, and reputation will increase. Right, so there's no purport of verse 13, but this verse 14, we definitely have a purport. So Prabhupada says, in the Vedic civilization, the king is advised by saintly people. That, of course, we've heard many times. And, and, and thus, through doing that, he becomes the greatest executive power and everyone in the kingdom becomes happy and prosperous. And previously, great kings were very responsible in following the instructions of saintly people. They used to accept the instructions by, given by great sages like Parashara, Vyasadeva, Narada, Devala, Asita, and then execute their monarchical power. Unfortunately, in Kali Yuga, Government heads don't do that, so nobody is happy. Neither the rulers nor the people in general. So the duration of life, in Kali Yuga, duration of life is short, shortened. Everyone is wretched. Nobody has bodily strength or, or spiritual power. So Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, if citizens want to be happy and prosperous in this democratic age, they should not elect rascals and fools who have no respect for saintly persons. 15. Those who live according to religious principles and who follow them by words, mind, body and intelligence uh, are elevated to the heavenly kingdom which is devoid of all miseries. Being thus rid of the material influence, they achieve unlimited happiness in life. Okay, so let's have a look at the purport. So the sages, they're instructing King Vena that he should set an example by living, <coughs> by living, by living religiously. Shouldn't make a show of material religion but actually do devotional service to the Lord, which is done with the words, mind, body, and intelligence. In this way, the government will be free from the contaminations of Maya, and people will be also, and they'll all go back to Godhead. So Srila Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, the instructions given herein serve as a summary of how the head of government should execute his ruling power and thus attain happiness, not only in this life, but also in, but also in, in the life after death. Verse 16, the sages continued, O great hero, for this reason you should not be the cause of spoiling the spiritual life of the general populace. If their spiritual life is spoiled because of your activities, you will, sort, you will certainly fall down from your opulent and royal position. So, Purport Prabhupada says, Previously there were monarchies, but as they declined religiously to godless sense gratification, they had become abolished because the kings, queens, they were just exploiting 
the people and the situation for their sins gratification. But just abolishing them and using democracy is not enough unless the government men are religious and follow the, in the footsteps of great religionists. Verse 17, the saintly persons continued, when the king protects the citizens from the disturbances of mischievous ministers, as well as from thieves and rogues, he can, by virtue of such pious activities, accept taxes given by his subjects. Thus, thus a pious king can certainly enjoy himself in this world as well as in the life after death. Uh, the duty of the pious king is described nicely here. First, they must protect people from thieves and rogues, plus from ministers who know better than thieves and rogues. Formerly, the ministers were appointed by the king and they weren't elected. Then if the king was not pious or strict, the ministers became thieves and rogues and exploited the people. So the king's duty was to see that there's no increase in the thieves and rogues in, in the government sectariat or departments of public affairs. If he can't do that, he has no right to take taxes. So second paragraph. We find in Srimad Bhagavatam 12th Canto uh, vivid descriptions of these thieves and rogues in government service. And here is something quoted from them. Yeah, so Prabhupada's quotes from the 12th canto. These proud malachas, persons who are less than sudras, representing themselves as kings, will tyrannize their subjects. And their subjects, on the other hand, will cultivate the most vicious practices, thus practicing evil habits and behaving foolishly, the subjects will be like their rulers. So the idea is, in democracy, the population will fall down to become sudras. Practically all will be sudras. And sudras are not intelligent. Well, the sudras are not intelligent. Since people have fallen, they can only elect people in their categories, means fallen people. But government of sutras cannot work. The Kshatriyas should run the governments and the saintly people, the Brahmins. Of course, in the other three ages, the general populace was not so degraded, such a traitor to Apara. The head of the government was never elected. The king's the supreme executive. And if he caught ministers stealing, he would immediately have them killed or dismissed. As it was the king's duty to kill thieves and rogues, it was also his duty to kill dishonest ministers. So by strict vigilance, the king can run the government well and the citizens uh, will be happy under him. If he does like this, he can exact taxes, live happily and peacefully, and at the end of his life, go to heaven or even to Vaikuntha, 18. The king is supposed to be pious, in whose state and cities the general populace strictly observes the system of eight social orders of dhana and ashram, and where all citizens engage in worshipping the supreme personality of Godhead by their particular occupation. Right, so Prabhupada begins the purport by saying the state's duty and the citizen's duty are very nicely explained in this verse. The king or the government head should direct every should direct everything so that every one engages in devotional service to the Lord. The king or the government head is supposed to be representative of the Lord and see that the people are engaged in Vanashram. Vishnu Purana says, unless people are in Vanashram, society can't be considered human, also can't make any advancement towards the ultimate goal of life. Krishna Yajna Purusha, 
As Bhagavad Gita 5.29 says, He is the ultimate purpose of all sacrifice of all sacrifice, enjoyer of, sac of all sacrifice. So he's the Yajna Purusha. So in perfect human society, people in Varnashram, people are in Varnashram, and there they worship Lord, Lord Vishnu by their activities. They perfect their lives as Bhagavad Gita 1846 says. 1846. Which means, by worship of the Lord, who is the source of all beings and who is all pervading, man can, uh, in the performance of his own duty attain perfection so that's people are in all the vaisha all the uh, avarnas have to do their duties as defined in shastra and in this way they can satisfy the lord everyone can satisfy the lord so a state um, has to see that the citizens are thus engaged they, the, the state must not say they're secular, must be fully Varnashram. So today, the government, government people have no respect, respect for Varnashram. They feel the state should be secular. But in such a government, no one can be happy. Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, the people must follow the Varnashram Dharma and the king must see that they're following it sciencely and uh, nicely. So right, verse 19. O noble one, if the king sees that the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the original cause of the cosmic manifestation and the super soul within uh, everyone, so if the king sees that, that the Lord, who is described like this, that is worshipped, then the Lord will be satisfied. Okay, so first paragraph of the purport. There's just one anyway. So Prabhupada says, it's a fact that it's the government's duty to see the Lord is pleased by the activities of the people and the government. There's no possibility of happiness if the government people, if the government or the people have no idea of Bhagavan or no idea of Bhuta Bhavana, Vishvatma, Supersoul. The conclusion is that without doing devotional service, neither the people nor the government can be happy in any way. So now, Neither the people nor the government are interested to see that the people are doing devotional service. More interested, uh, more interested in machinery, the mach machinery of sense gratification. So the result is they're more and more implicated in the machinery of the laws of material nature. But people must be freed from entanglement in the mode. Right, so people in government have no idea about this, just interest in sense gratification and being happy in this one life. The word Nija Sasane in his own governmental duty shows that both the government and the people are responsible for executing Varnashram. So Srila Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, once the populace is situated in the Varnashram Dharma, there's every possibility of real life and prosperity, both in this world and in the next. Verse 20. The Supreme Personality of Godhead is worshipped by the great demigods, controllers of universal affairs. When he's satisfied, nothing is impossible to achieve. 
For this reason, all the demigods, the presiding deities of the different planets, as well as the inhabitants of their planets, take great pleasure in offering all kinds of paraphernalia for his worship. So let's have a look at the purport. Prabhupada begins the purport by saying, um, all Vedic civilization is summarized in this verse as follows. All living entities, either on this planet or on other planets, have to satisfy the Supreme Personality of Godhead by their respective duties. And when he's satisfied, all necessities are automatically supplied. Eko bahunam yovadadati kaman means he's supplying everyone's necessities. We see animals have no professions, but they're not dying for want of food. They're just following nature's way and everything's being provided, eating, sleeping, etc. Second paragraph of the purport. Humanity has artificially created a civilization which makes one forget the Lord. Uh, it enables one to forget his mercy and grace. The result is people are always unhappy and in need. They don't know the goal of life, that, that the goal of life is to satisfy Lord Vishnu. They have taken the material way of life, materialistic way of life as everything. They're captivated by material activities. The leaders always encourage them to do this. And the people blindly follow down the path of unhappiness. So everyone must be trained in Krishna consciousness following Varnashram. The state must see that the people are satisfying the Lord. That's their prime duty. Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, the Krishna consciousness movement was started to convince the general populace to adopt the best process by which to satisfy the Supreme Personality of Godhead and thus solve all problems. Verse 21. Dear King, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, along with the predominating deities, is the enjoyer of the results of all sacrifices in all planets. The Supreme Lord is the sum total of the three Vedas, the owner of everything, and the ultimate goal of all austerity. Therefore your countrymen should engage in performing various sacrifices for your elevation. For your elevation, the King. Indeed, you should always direct them towards the offering of sacrifices. And don't forget, devotees, <laughs> that King Vena has already told them so strongly, no sacrifice, nothing of the sort, no religious activities. Verse 22, when all the Brahmins engage in performing sacrifices in your kingdom, all the demigods who are, who are plenary expansions of the Lord will be very much satisfied by their activities and will give you your desired result. Therefore, O hero, do not stop the sacrificial performances. If you stop them, you will disrespect the demigods. All right, so the fourth section, verse 23 to 28, Vena responds to the sages. Okay, we'll read through the verses first of all. Verse 23, King Vena replied, you are not at all experienced. It is very much regrettable that you are maintaining something which is not religious and are accepting it as religious. Indeed, I think you are giving up your real husband who maintains you and are searching after some paramour to worship. 24. Those who out of gross ignorance do not worship the king, this is Vena speaking, those who out of gross ignorance do not worship the king, who is actually the supreme personality of Godhead, 
experience happiness neither in this world nor in the world after death. 25. You are so much devoted to the demigods, but who are they? Inde indeed, your affection for these demigods is exactly like the affection of an, of an unchaste woman who neglects her married life and gives all attention to her paramour. Verses 26 to 27. Lord Vishnu, Lord Brahma, Lord Shiva, Lord Indra, Vayu, the master of air, Yama, the superintendent of death, the sun god, the director of rainfall, Kuvera, the treasurer, the moon god, the predominating deity of the earth, Agni, the fire god, Varuna, the lord of waters, and all others who are great and competent to bestow benedictions or to curse, all abide in the body of the king. For this reason, the king is known as the reservoir of all demigods, who are simply parts and parcels of the king's body. Verse 28, King Vena continued, For this reason, O Brahmins, you should abandon your envy of me, and by your ritualistic activities, you should worship me and offer me all paraphernalia. If you're intelligent, you should know that there's no personality superior to me who can accept the first oblations of all sacrifices. Right, so anyway, just see Vena. He's like a madman. He really is. He's just like a madman. So anyway, we will continue tomorrow. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai.